Dear all, welcome to Volume and welcome to downtown Copenhagen and welcome to hopefully a hectic debate on a new European project which has enthusiastically taken us all by storm, namely the EU Commission's new project on creating a new European Bauhaus. Welcome to you back home and welcome to the audience here before the stage live at Volume. Today we have a, a, a distinct uh, team of, of panelists. I normally call my good friends who I know very well on an, on an everyday basis for three power people within design and architecture. And by the way, I'm Torben Klitgaard. I'm the CEO of BlocksHub, which is an urban innovation hub in, in downtown Copenhagen. And today we're going to discuss a little bit about what can architecture and design and aesthetics and culture do for the green transition, for the immense problem of overshooting, uh, not only uh, on, a, on, an, on a European scale, but on a global scale. And what can these uh, initiatives do to combat the climate change uh, challenge that is facing us in, in, these, in these times? We have a... a, a, a a minor panel, I would say, three panelists today. First and foremost from Brussels, Pernille Weiss. Uh, a warm welcome to you on the uh, virtual platform today. Over there, I think you are. And um, we, have, uh, we have Lone Pfeiffer from uh, Velux. Welcome to you as well. And last but not least, of course, we've got you, Christian. Christian Basin, CEO of the Danish Design Center. And um, I would like to, to start out today's discussion on the new European Bauhaus movement by uh, looking to you in Brussels, Penilla. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Penilla Weiss uh, very well, uh, Penilla is, uh, is, uh, has, a, has a very, very long track record, so to speak. You uh, are in any way a very, very cross-disciplinary person. You started out your career as a trained nurse. Uh, you have a master's in health science and a master's degree in leadership and innovation. And Penilla also founded the company here back in Copenhagen some years ago called Archimed, which focused on consulting uh, in order to create a healthier workspace. Nowadays, Penilla uh, has a platform as, an, as a member of the European Parliament, a platform out of Brussels, as a member of Parliament for the Danish Conservative Party. Uh, and you are uh, an enthusiastic um, voice within architecture and design and therefore of course turning to you in order for you to give us sort of a, a, an overview of the new European Bauhaus movement as, as seen from the, uh, f from the EU, as seen from a European standpoint. Could you, Penilla, just give us the overall uh, view of what is, uh, in, in your way, why is the new European Bauhaus movement important and and to be more specific, what's the edge? Does that make sense, <laughs> Penilla? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, everything you say always makes sense. Uh, oh, my you're so dear, nice. Thank you so old much. Colleague, <laughs> my dear colleague from the good old days in Akitema. Uh, thank you so much for a very warm uh, um, and soothing welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to be together with uh, all of you. And I hope that the, the, the whole uh, Green Impact Week is really doing an impact uh for the green transition but also all the difficult uh, um, um, challenges uh, ahead of us not only uh, in terms of the climate uh, challenges uh and the transition uh, but also in the framework of the um the corona crisis and the trade wars and whatever else is on our plate as europeans uh, where we must Okay, maybe I'm a little puzzled now because the screen on my side is uh, shaking a lot. Is everything okay? Yep, it's, it's, it's because what you are saying is so powerful that the whole thing <laughs> is shaking up Stop here, it. I think. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, I know I can also be a pain in the ass, so maybe that's only in <laughs> the underlining of, of that's that That's another panel. Of my curriculum. Okay, uh, now let's get to the point uh, and, and uh, the questions that you uh, asked me, uh, Torben. Uh, in your initial remark, you said it, it, that the European Bauhaus is a commission initiative. It certainly it is, but I would like to underline that it actually is an EU a shared um, 
a project, an initiative taken uh, by the, uh, the chair of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, but absolutely embraced uh, by the House of the European Parliament. Uh, I represent um, my group in the work because I'm kind of a standing rapporteur uh, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the work with the uh, European Bauhaus. And right now, and also right after we have said goodbye to each other this uh, afternoon today, I'm uh, rushing into a, a new meeting uh, in a, a group called the New Re European Bauhaus Friendship Group in the European Parliament, where I, together with uh, uh, a double handful of colleagues out of the 705, uh, are co-creating uh, right now together with uh, each other to also be to be a part of the um, uh, ideation process that is uh, at stake right now. And just this morning, actually, I finalized uh, my contribution. Uh, and that's also what I would like to address for the next uh, uh, couple of, of minutes. And maybe also that can be a, a, a comment by the other uh, panelists that what I really, really hope to see happen with the European Bauhaus Initiative is that we not only um, begin to develop a strong and coherent common a shared language in the union about what is spatial design and the physical environment actually doing to us as citizens uh, as families uh, the the whole impact of architecture to our health uh, to our economy to our climate etc etc we really really need a common shared language and methodology of also how to assess different uh, types of typologies of existing and, and future uh, spatial projects. Um, so there is a language issue, and I'm trying to address that in an angle I, that I until now think is, has been a little bit uh, overseen by all the enthusiasm in the European Bauhaus initiative, namely then whenever we talk about uh, spatiality and, and, and Bauhaus, we associate it to something that we can see, something that is already built uh, and stands out as a disaster or a success and something in its bits and pieces or in its whole concept that we would like to, to duplicate uh, or uh, tear down uh, um, uh, either way. Where I... Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we not only assess what we see uh, with our eyes and that we can mm, have opinions uh, about uh, more or less academic, more or less evidence-based. Uh, I really would like to see that we also in the framework of the European Bauhaus establishes uh, a, a, a toolbox of methodologies of how actually to assess whether something is, to be very frank and directly, is poor or rich in its impact. And also uh, in a way where the evidence-based design methodology helps us to understand why is actually this project or this example or this uh, technology in the, the, the specific um, either typology or uh, the specific project, why is it actually working or not working? And what values does a co-creative and more interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, to future new European Bauhaus projects, uh, what can we actually um, uh, uh, see grow uh, in, in increase because it's values we want more of and where can we see that we actually also address some of the problems and the values we would like to have less of. It can be from crime to health, uh, the sense of security, it can be uh, quality of life measurements, it can be uh, um, uh, it can be PISA outcome of assessing schools and the design and the concepts of the schools but of course also uh, in terms of, of the framework of the, uh, the Green Impact Week, uh, the impact that the circular economy and the life cycle approaches to uh, the uh, renovation wave of the existing buildings, but also new buildings coming up uh, in the future, um, 
where we put more conscious on uh, the uh, interrelationships between architecture and the impact on nature and climate that do we really know what exact to do and what also are the implications and the synergies and the antagonists uh, because when we work, when we talk about uh, and when we work uh, with the uh, the physical environment, uh, we sometimes tend to get because we get so overwhelmed by the multifacetility um, uh, of of the complex system uh, that both is architecture, interior, atmosphere, architect, uh, arch acoustic, uh, human behavior, the culture of the organization individual uh, uh, sympathies and, and, and state of minds in a specific uh, situation uh, taking place, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. All of you who have worked with especially hospitals and nursing homes, uh, um, social buildings uh, the last uh, many years know that uh, it's not that easy to put in a, on a formal uh, what is actually Bauhaus uh, truth. So we need a methodology and I would like to actually put that forward and now I will, uh, I will end that I really do hope that in the framework and the platform that the European Bauhaus can create that we not only see good ideas, concrete examples, um, uh, specific technologies and concepts, but that we also strive towards establishing a kind of a evidence space European Bauhaus Encyclopedia, a design lab, uh, a process design uh, methodology, an assessment tool, maybe also a certification. Why not actually have the ambition to create an EU uh, accreditation on how to do uh, evidence-based design in the overall, um, uh, you could say, philo philo uh, philosophy of, uh, of European Bauhaus, because European Bauhaus is about creating more value by doing things in another way that we usually would do. So if we should capture this value and also be able to, to share it with, with one another, we need to have a, a, a toolbox of how to actually articulate and, and also assess, maybe sometimes also even measure uh, the impact. So. That's where I am right now, this morning, and also after this uh, talk. <laughs> but that, that, that is okay for now, Pernille. Thank you for your extreme enthusiasm and array of different suggestions as to what the new European Bauhaus movement has to cater for. Um, you talked about both the need to, to, to create a common language, uh, the need to cross over different professions, but also the need to maybe in, in, induce and enhance uh, uh, certifications, standardization, et cetera, et cetera. And that just leads me to say that you, the, 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 the game of actually changing the world, the, the, the plan of combating climate change has to involve a different, different ball games, so to speak. Normally, I, I, I label it as, as, as a, you, you might play the power game, uh, or you might also play the passion game. The power game meaning, you know, standardization, uh, public procurement procedures, national legislation, uh, uh, CO2 tariffs, etc., etc. You can actually push development through those means. But you can also, from the bottom up, play the passion game. And I really, really feel that the uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the EU uh, Commissioner, or uh, Chief, Chief of Staff, so to speak, has really, really put <laughs> forward a new sort of passionate agenda here. So, so, so you can you can do both both uh, both uh, sing, things, and and the reason why I'm talking about passion, of course, is because I'm turning to to you, Christian, now because no one is more passionate about design and change than than you, of course. Um, you have for many 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 years uh, been uh, a leading expert on design strategies, on design thinking. Nowadays, uh, you are the CEO of the Danish Design Center and you are advising both uh, public uh, policy makers, uh, governments, uh, communities, uh, uh, municipalities, of course, and corporates in uh, uh, the design uh, thinking, design mindset, and transformation through design. You are deeply involved in the Danish initiative, or should I call it the Danish-led initiative? You might explain that a little bit more in depth. Uh, so, so please indulge and, and uh, enlighten us here, the audience, both here and, and online. What are sort of so far the Danish 
sort of overall reflection on how we can create a new European Bauhaus. Christian. Yeah, thanks. Well, first, thanks, Penile, for, for your, your serve and, uh, and framing for this uh, conversation and also Torben for the introduction. So, so first of all, just to reflect that, that what's happening uh, in Europe right now is a, it's a huge experiment. And I have not seen in the time I've spent the last two decades looking into um, innovation in policy making and design, anything as ambitious and as big scale as this, where basically what we're seeing is an invitation, maybe for the first time in the European Union's history, to ask the creative industries, especially architecture and design, to take leadership in driving a very, very significant, broad change process for society, which is the green transition. And also the other transitions that you, Penila, mentioned that are also critical, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's uh, uh, poverty, whether it's economic development and so on, because the green transition will be cross-cutting across all of that. So when we in Denmark saw that, and, and back in, 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 in the fall, when, when I first uh, heard uh, von der Leyen's speech, but also spoke with, a, with, with friends in the commission, we could qu quickly see that we needed to start moving into this space from the side of, of the ecosystem we have in, in blocks and the ecosystem we have broader in the Danish architecture and design field. Um, so we built, starting uh, late last year, uh, and what you could say is the Danish Alliance. Um, originally led by a small uh, team from the Danish Architecture Center, Blockshop, Danish Design Center and, and Creative Denmark, uh, with uh, the Confederation of Danish Industry as a, as, a, as a partner representing tens of thousands of companies and representing uh, the scale and the potential in getting the markets involved in this as well, to what is now an alliance where we had, have involved, I think, more than 200 institutions and organizations in exactly the spirit of new ways of working that the entire Bauhaus program is about, but also the kinds of tools and methodologies and, 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 and approaches, but also mindsets that you, Penila, were mentioning. So taking that entire ecosystem and beginning to co-create, to uh, explore what, what is actually the problem that is being addressed here, what are perhaps the long-term intentions and, and, and the frame we can talk into from the Commission side, what are the unique Danish capabilities if we want to propose our sort of put our leadership into this mix? Um, we talk a lot about what the Danish design DNA is, uh, which is really about uh, our societal values. So how do we, from this part of the world, this part of Europe, design and create uh, in ways that are social, that are inclusive, that have a particular, and you could call it a Nordic aesthetic in terms of form giving, that have a human focus and a user focus, that are holistic also in terms of sustainability and creating solutions that are long lasting and so on. How do you focus on craftsmanship, which is also part of the Bauhaus originally? And all of those questions coming to the fore across all these actors, businesses, architects, designers, academics, institutions, and so on. And what we came up to, and I'll con conclude in a, in a moment, is that through this process of, of true design work, which is to, ex to ex explore, but also to co-create, and then to begin to give form and shape to something, we are now at a point where we are seeing a shape or direction emerge for what we in Denmark could contribute with. And we're calling that designing the irresistible circular society, which means we are making some choices around the activity of design, in a broad sense that includes architecture and other creative industries, the focus on the attractive, irresistible, the aesthetic, the inviting, the open uh, community and society that needs to become more circular in maybe even a radical way where we, take, we don't take resources out of the ground and just manufacture them, consume them, discard them, but where we create new loops and we close loops of resource use and reuse and reuse in, in the long term. And so that's the frame. And I'll leave to, to uh, uh, Luna to, to expand more on, on, uh, on how this talks into the built environment and, and the entire uh, infrastructures we need to work with that I agree with Penilla goes beyond what's physical, but the physical, of course, is, is a pretty key component in all of this in terms of resources. But to say that when we then open, uh, when we unpack that direction, we see that we need to speak into the social and the community side 
speaking of the DNA, but also of what the European, European Union is asking for, we need to talk into nature and resilience and, uh, and, and our, our, our natural environment and the interplay with cities. And we need to talk into systems. We need to talk into redesigning the ways in which we collaborate across industries, the way government and, 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 and business and, and creatives work together. So we need to, to pursue those different tracks. And just yesterday, we ran a pretty um, intensive workshop, I would say, on these three streams around uh, the, the nature, around community, and around systems to really find out ways where we can leverage uh, the, what we can do here in Denmark. But of course, the next step will be to open up to uh, the international community, both in Europe and beyond, so that this does not become a flag-waving uh, nationalistic uh, project, but becomes an invitation to collaborate with us uh, in, the, in, in, in that direction. So, Thank you, Christian. Thank you uh, for sketching out the, the, the challenges and, and obviously also the opportunities. Lone, you and I have eye contact now, I can see, so it's, it's over to you. Um, you, more than anyone else, knows the business of the, the, of the built environment, so to speak. Uh, you're a, a director for sustainable buildings at Velux on an everyday basis, but you're also a secretary general. That sounds nice, secretary general for the International Active House Alliance. So you have your boots firmly placed on the ground here in Denmark, but also on the international scene. Um, the new European Bauhaus movement really requires quite, quite a lot of us. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity, but it also requires new thinking, cross-disciplinary thinking and open mindset. Pernilla set that out in her opening remarks as well. And to be honest, we know the construction industry as a, as a pretty conservative old man, to be honest. So, so to, to, to what extent do you think that the construction okay. ecosystem can, can really actually play a part here and, and cater for all this new innovative thinking? Is, is, that, is that something you think is doable with your experience? It's a good question. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tom. And also thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Penilla, for, for your... Uh, uh, for your initial thoughts and, and also to Christian, I, I definitely uh, agree with a lot of what you have said. Um, and we, um, both in my capacity at Velux, but also at the Active House Alliance, we, we welcome the initiative and hats off to Madam President and the whole uh, Commission and the Parliament for initiating this and setting it afloat. And it was clear that the day after it was started off, uh, there was all, it had already begun, I think you said that at a very early stage, Christian, that we don't have to wait for prices to arrive or uh, centers to be established. We can already start thinking. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. It's applying a different mindset. Um, I'll come back to the construction. Don't worry. Uh, I, I'd just like to say a few um, introductory, uh, introductory words because I think, yes, it's, uh, it's about the society that we want to build and see in 2050. Uh, and how can, we, uh, how can we look ahead and how can we discuss that? So in Denmark, we were a group of designers from the Danish Design Council who sat down and said, we need a way of discussing this. How can we do these conversations? Because the listening phase that was initiated by, um, as the first thing, is still going on. And that was very important. How can we start listening into to what, we've, what we should apply here? And that shouldn't be experts, it should be actually everybody, because the society of 2050 is everybody's business. And that, I think, is the ingenious uh, um, element of how it has been uh, launched and also executed. One thing is saying it, but, but another thing is that it actually is, um, it is uh, concretizing as, as such. We developed a conversation tool, and you can uh, take a test yourself, bauhausconversations.eu. Um, there's a number of, I think, 60 conversations lying there now where you can plug in the results. There's a few questions to get you started because we need the, to have the discussion about the society that we want in 2050. And once we have done that, and I have had three or four conversations which opened my mind and also you know, across generations, across professions, um, that means a lot that you stop sort of only looking at what you do best on an everyday basis and sort of expand your, uh, your horizon. And that is just a huge advantage of, uh, of the whole initiative. But coming back to um, yeah, my profession, the, the building system, or at, as it has been formulated, rethinking the ecosystem of construction, because that is a very key part of, um, of the initiatives. 
which would be expected to, to deliver on the uh, climate goals, namely in the renovation wave. I've heard the number 35 million energy renovated homes in Europe mentioned as a goal. That's a lot because currently we have a renovation rate of 1% to 2% a year. So that's definitely something we need to get going. And for that, how to do that? Because we have all the good engineers, we have all the good building professionals, we have all the materials. We need to apply a different way of thinking about it. And that's where the ecosystem comes in and, and the systemic um, way of thinking um, and where we need to close the loop or, or, or have in mind what buildings are. Coming back to what you said, Penilla, the value of buildings is not the brick and mortar that you see, but it is um, the relationship or how it has been formulated in the, in the call. Uh, the beautiful leg, there are three legs, beautiful, sustainable and together. And the beautiful one is interpreted as in the quality of the experience that you have. And think about your home, if you want to go home later today, are you longing to get back to that front door made of that kind of wood? No, it's not, it's the feeling of home, it's the quality of that experience and to which extent you feel at home. And we need to respect that, um, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, no, sorry, the, it was Warren Buffet. He said, price is what you pay, but value is what you get. And we often, with buildings, look at uh, what does it cost and when can it be finished and when can I sell it to someone else. So it's been looked on as a commodity, which it also is, of course. But any building we do out of a welfare position, and that we have to evaluate. We have to put numbers on that. And I think a certification system for something like that, buildings in use, what are they worth? Um, existing homes, what is it you should renovate, where should you start, what would bring you furthest towards the climate goals, what would make it most sustainable. We don't actually have this assessment system or valuation system. We have postal codes and tax systems and energy labels, but that doesn't say much. So we need to combine those things and that will require a different kind of um, systemic uh, thinking from the built environment. And I think it's ready for it. Mm. So, so talking about systemic thinking and uh, cr again coming back to my notion on the cross disciplinarity, it's it's we are, we're talking about a mindset shift here, and that's the reason why the Danish initiative is, is focusing very much on on the circular, uh, circular thinking, the circular society. Uh, how how do we, if we should just sort of push it a little bit more in the next next round here, Panilla, turning to you again, how should we focus on? You talk about the shared language but but we're talking about eu eu is a is a is a is a, is a pretty tough lady right she's uh, you know 20 27 countries uh, lots of different languages lots of different generations there's a different mm. generation gap mm. there's a cultural gap and mm. and all of a sudden we want mm. to have a shared language well how how, how can we actually do that <laughs> it's a it's a well. it's, it, it's a tough <laughs> assignment you're you're putting forward today what are yeah, your thoughts on that? And I, and I said to you, I am a pain in the ass, but I actually, uh, Lone... So now uh, is the she... time to turn to that. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, no, no. No, actually, I think that uh, Lona had a, a good point. Uh, we could start uh, with the energy efficiency uh, because that is a currency that is very specific. Uh, it is also, uh, a, 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 you know, a currency that we all uh, apply to because we have the strategy of, of being a uh, an independent energy union uh, as soon as possible, and also we have uh, the uh, the uh, the climate goals in the EU new uh, climate law. Uh, so we have uh, the CO two emissions, we have the energy efficiency, the energy consumption uh, of our uh, physical world, and actually also we have the taxonomy now and the uh, the, the, the the policies for circular uh, economy, the principles for circular economy. So I, I honestly think that we do actually have uh, uh, some common shared language, at, at, at least in, in order to, to organize ourselves about what are the aims we would like to address. And then maybe prioritize uh, a little bit uh, in between all the good you can do with the spatial design and the physical environment. Let's start by creating some and good examples of success where we actually manage to um, be cost efficient in uh, the the design iterations that were done maybe on existing projects maybe on 
uh, typologies where we agree with each other, let's address these t uh, typologies in the European Bauhaus and see what we can come up with as innovative design um, processes, maybe uh, hopefully also uh, specific uh, design technologies, new technologies, new combinations of materials, uh, etc., etc. Uh, I think it's very crucial that we, in order also to keep the good energy uh, growing and flowing uh, in the European Bauhaus, that we come up with a good handful of, uh, of, of living laboratories, living examples uh, that can engage people and that, uh, that also gives new stories of, of, of bits and pieces of examples in the, their com complexity. Um, and also I would like to address that it's very important that we also engage our uh, education and research environments into this year because the industry, the industries, uh, plurally, uh, and, and the SMEs, they have a huge, huge muscle to work with but in order to also give it direction and also to fuel the future workforce coming from the schools and the, and the universities, we must engage them and they actually know uh, a little bit more maybe than uh, what goes on uh, in an SME, but they know how to do evidence-based design because that is actually evidence-based processing is what goes on in universities. So there we have actually also some, we don't have to, reinvent the wheel, honestly. It's just a, a matter of being a little bit more systematic, I guess. Thank you so much. Uh, I, th this discussion could go on forever uh, without question. These are short sessions this afternoon and, and we are pretty much coming to a close in, in some minutes time. But of course, we, we need your views on this. Christian, uh, when the word uh, labs was mentioned by Panilla, you uh, raised your eyebrows. I start well. jumping. So, so I, I think it's, um, well, what also triggered me a little bit in, in what you said, Panilla, is um, technology and, 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 and solutions out there, right? Because technology will change towards 2050, and uh, political leaders will change, governments will change, uh, generations will even change. But what I think is so powerful now is back to the point about this being a creatively led project is and, and the european commission or the european union is, is actually paving the way i mean luna said there's a listening phase when was the last time you heard european institutions talk about a listening phase <laughs> or a design phase so so that's actually what that's that's the frame we're talking into and that feels comfortable i think it feels right because it speaks to these sectors and so what does that mean in practice? That means that what we're talking about is a movement. It's a very, very long-term mobilization of resources in society that are about starting with the human condition. It's starting with citizens, with people, and consumers, and customers, young and old, across all of Europe. It's also starting with their relationship with nature and other living things, because this is also what this is about. So it is not user-centered, it is living centered it's about life in europe and on the planet it's about leveraging imagination we talk about 2050 what would we imagine so it's about imagination and cre creative leaps of faith in terms of what might be possible it's very much about experimentation again because some of the technologies we're going to need don't exist yet the solutions we need the networks we need the partnerships we need don't exist yet and first and foremost i think it's about learning it's going to be about creating a new community of practice around uh, how architecture design and the creative sectors can inspire and, and really lead this transformation and how we learn rapidly from that. So to, to put two lines under it, it's actually about building that capacity. It's, it's a massive lift in capacity for sustainable change. That's what this project is about. Mm. So, Lona? Yes, thank yeah. you. I also reacted to, to, to labs um, in the Active House Alliance that I am... Uh, General Secretary for, I'd like to look at myself as a playmaker. I think that's more corresponding to how I work. But uh, I'm leading an international NGO on a holistic approach to sustainable buildings called Healthy Buildings for People and Planet. So never one without the other. So a playmaking General Secretary, is that what we're okay. talking about? Okay, if Great. you like, we can, we can go with that, Tom. Um, we have submitted, there has just been the, the deadline for submitting uh, for the new European Bauhaus prices yesterday at 12. And we submitted three examples, which are not like one single standing uh, examples, but they are all learning living labs. Mm. 
because one thing, you can easily do a building once. <laughs> That's not a trick, but do it every day. Do the main, change the mainstream of buildings. And um, if you want everything Kristen said, what is going to be different in 2050, I agree with. But one thing is not different than what is here today, the buildings. 90% of the buildings in 2050 exactly. are already here. Mm. So we're looking at it. Yeah. And we have to send, find out how do we go about it. And I don't want to criticize circularity because that's definitely a part of it. As long as it is not about end of life, mm. it has to be about life. It has to be about the use of the buildings. What, what is, how can we continue that and prolong it? In being a bit provocative, um, an interpretation of the original Bauhaus was the um, housing blocks which are to get today ghettos because of the cranes and, and how you could mount them. They are being torn down today. It's not because they are redundant and because they can't be used anymore. It's because of lack of love mm. uh, for the buildings. Mm. So we have to create lack buildings which has mm. a lot of love. Mm. Mm. And the last <laughs> point, I have to make it, sorry guys, but it's 90 years since the original Bauhaus uh, had to close uh, because it was, was closed by the Nazis. Um, but it was mainly a movement fronted by men. There were a lot of women, but they were not allowed in the workshops by the men. It was quite a masculine movement. And I really uh, think that this uh, way of launching the new European Bauhaus could only be done by the first female president of the, <laughs> of the European Union. And I think we need to finish what they started. They did prototyping, but it turned a bit elitist and very craftsman-based. We need to make it mm. mainstream. Mm. But I think, I think you're right, and I think, uh, of course, uh, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, lots of both men and women are allowed inside the rooms nowadays. So, so, so I think yeah. we've, to some extent, solved that, that problem. One thing that just strikes me here at the end is, is, uh, is sort of the, uh, the, um, the need to create, as Christian said, the, the movement. But it's, it's, a, it's a movement for us. But uh, in all due respect, we are close to 50, if not uh, 50 plus. Uh, you know, we're talking about a movement that uh, reaches out 30 years from now. So the next generation, the generation set, the millenniums, it's a different, difficult word, are the ones that are going to actually change all of this. If the world could have changed, we would have done it already. Actually, we are up here today, we, you know, with the task not being done, so to speak. So we're looking ahead in the, in the, in the, in the years to come. But, and we're also talking about renovation. We're talking about energy efficient. And so, with all due respect, energy efficiency is not very sexy. It's not very cool. It's not very aesthetic. It's not very cultural. We need, we need, we need new ways of interpreting how to create that, that, that beautiful room that you were talking about or your home. Not the door, but the, but the, 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 the behavior going on inside, the love, the family, everything. How can, how can we actually cater for that in this movement? How can we make sure that the ones actually striving for what we're talking about, the ones really focusing on the next 30 plus years is the next generation? Uh, that, that's an open question here, and that will be the last question of today's session. So, uh, short answers, Okay, starting I'll try off with you, Lonan. Thanks, I'll try and go uh, shortly. Uh, absolutely, uh, for the next generations, that's, uh, that's where you need to look. And I try to listen a lot to next year. As a partner in the new European Bauhaus, the Alliance gives uh, every month. Uh, they give, uh, we give, we hold a virtual gathering. Last week we had the European Youth Forum and we have a PhD from a uh, university in Milan to bring forward their ideas and visions because anything we do and submit also from the Danish side uh, should be tested with the Gen Ys and the Gen Z um, with the question, why didn't you already do this? What are you going to do mm. different? Please convince me about that. Exactly. That, is the, that is the real uh, acid test I think we need to, uh, to do. Yeah. Okay, great. Christian, and then ending off with Pernille, and we're down to one minute, ladies so and gentlemen. So very, very briefly. Short answers. Um, we, we, we involved youth yesterday in our workshops, uh, but I'm not sure it was the right way. I think we also have to respect that young people want to talk to young people. And we need to support but not intervene in allowing them to have their own conversations as well. And their own conversation, I would ask them the following question. I would ask them, what do you want to do? Yes, we messed this up. We're not leaving the planet in too good a shape for you. Uh, we, will, we will continue to work on this very hard. But what do you want to do? And where do you want to go? What's your vision, as you said, of a good society? 
Thank you so much, well, uh, Christian. And a, a last short statement <laughs> from you, Panilla. Then you'll end up this uh, I, this I, afternoon I re discussion. I, re I, I really have to be maybe a little provocative and counterbalance this. Uh, uh, let's talk to to the young people and listen to them what they want. I want us all to put more narratives to why we live the lives that we do right now, but also why are we where we are now? There are in the uh, physical environment, in our architecture, in our cities, in our homes, in our buildings, in our plants, everywhere we have uh, the, the human physical expression in our buildings and in our society, we have narratives of our history and our values as human beings interacting and taking responsibility, sharing responsibility with each other. Don't leave the young people alone with their own thoughts about how to, to, to deal with the equation that we may be too easily say, okay, we failed, you will have the say. I will not leave them there. I think we should do this. You can be 100, you can be 10 years old to come up with the the, the, the silver bullet solution and definitely the European Bauhaus is about all citizens, all ages, all genders, all nationalities. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Panilla Weiss. Uh, I think the conclusion is we messed it up together and we're going to solve it together, right? <laughs> Uh, so, and the new European Bauhaus is certainly a great frame to do that. Thank you so much, Panilla, <laughs> uh, Vice uh, Member of Parliament EU, Lone, Pfeiffer, Velux, among other things, and you, of course, Christian Basin, Danish Design Center. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.